Welcome to Fortune Forecast. I am Daisy, your hostess. You are in my book playlist, and we are going through the chapters of the book titled The Book of Life by Upton Sinclair, published in 1921 by the Payne Book Company in Chicago. It is in the public domain. We're going to move right into the next chapter from part two, the book of the body, chapter 22, titled Foods and Poisons. Concludes the subject of diet and discusses the effect upon the system of stimulants and narcotics. A few years ago, there died an old gentleman who had devoted some 20 years of his life to teaching people to chew their food. Horace Fletcher was his name, and his ideas became a fad, and some people carried them to comical extremes. But Fletcher made a real discovery, what he called the food filter. This is the automatic action of the swallowing apparatus, whereby nature selects a food which has been sufficiently prepared for digestion. If you chew a mouthful of food without ever performing the act of swallowing, you will find that the food gradually disappears. What happens is that all of it which has been reduced to a thin paste will slip unnoticed down your throat and you may go on putting more food into your mouth and chewing and can eat a whole meal without ever performing the act of swallowing. Fletcher claimed that this is the proper way to eat and that you can train yourself to follow this method. I have tried his idea and adopted it. One of my diet rules, to which there is no exception, is that if I haven't the time to chew my food properly, I haven't the time to eat. I skip that meal. The habit of bolting food is a source of disease. To be sure, the carnivorous animals bolt their food, but they are tougher than we are and do not carry the burden of a large brain and a complex nervous system. If you swallow your meals half-chewed and wash them down with liquids, you may get away with it for a while, but some day you will pay for it with dyspepsia and nervous troubles. And the same thing applies to your habit of jumping up from meals and rushing away to work, whether it be work of the muscles or of the brain and nerves. Proper digestion requires the presence of a quantity of blood in the walls of the stomach and digestive tract. It requires the attention of your subconscious mind, and this means rest of muscles and brain centers. If you cannot rest for an hour after meals, omit that meal or make it a light one of fruit juices, which are almost immediately absorbed by the stomach and of salads, which do not ferment. You may rest assured that it will not hurt you to skip a meal and make up for it when you have time to be quiet. I have been many times in my life under very intense and long-continued nervous strain. For example, during the Colorado coal strike, I led a public demonstration which kept me in a state of excitement all the day and a good part of the night several weeks. During this period, I ate almost nothing. A baked apple and a cup of custard would be as near as I would go to a meal. And as a result, I came through the experience without any injury whatever to my health. I lost perhaps 10 pounds in weight, but that was quickly made up when I settled back to a normal way of life. I have been on camping trips when I had a great deal of hard work to do, carrying a canoe long distances on my back, paddling it 40 miles a day. On the mornings of such a trip, I have seen a guide cook himself an elaborate breakfast of freshly baked bread, bacon, and even beans, and make a hearty meal, and then go straight to work. My meal, on the contrary, would consist of a small dish of stewed prunes, or perhaps some huckleberries or raspberries if they could be found. I will not say that I could do as much as the guide, because he was used to it and I was not. But I can say this. If I had eaten his breakfast at the start of the day, I would have been dead before midnight. And I mean the word dead, quite literally. I know a man who started to climb Whiteface Mountain in the Adirondacks. He climbed halfway and then ate lunch, which consisted of nine hard-boiled eggs. Then he started to climb the rest of the mountain and dropped dead of acute indigestion. There are a few poisons which can affect the system more quickly 
or more dangerously than a mass of food which is not digested. The stomach is an ideal forcing house for the breeding of bacteria. It provides warmth and moisture, and you, in your meal, provide the bacteria and the material upon which they thrive. Under normal conditions, the stomach pours out a gastric juice which kills the bacteria. But let this gastric juice for any reason be lacking because your nervous energy has gone somewhere else or because your bloodstream from which the gastric juice must be made has been drawn away to the muscles by hard labor. Then you have a yeast pot with great quantities of gases and poisons. In acute cases, the results are evident enough. Violent pains and convulsions, followed by coma and the turning black of the body. But what you should understand is that you may produce a milder case of such poisoning and may do it day after day habitually, and little by little your vital organs will be weakened by the strain. It does not make any difference at what hour of the 24 you take the great bulk of your food. It is one of the commonest delusions that you get some strengthening effect from your food immediately and must have this strength in order to do hard work. To be sure, there are substances such as grape sugar which require practically no digesting. You can hold them in the mouth and they will be digested by the saliva and absorbed at once into the bloodstream. But unless you have been starved for a long period, you do not need to get your strength in this rush fashion. If you ate your normal meals on the previous day, your bloodstream is fully supplied with nutriment, which has been put through a long process of preparation, and you can get up in the morning and work all day, if necessary, upon what is already in your system. To be sure, you may feel hungry and even faint, but that is merely a matter of habit. Your system is accustomed to taking food and expects it. But if you are a laborer doing hard work, you can easily train yourself to eat a light meal in the morning and another light meal at noon and to eat a hearty meal when your work is done and you can rest. Two light meals and a hearty meal are all that any system needs and you can prove it to yourself by trying it and watching your weight once a week. I have tried many experiments and the conclusion to which I have come is that there is no virtue in any particular meal hours or any particular number of meals. For several years I tried the experiment of two meals a day. I was living a retired life and had little contact with the world and I would make a hearty meal at 10 o'clock in the morning and another at 5 in the afternoon. But later on I found that inconvenient and now I take a light breakfast and two moderate sized meals at the conventional hours of lunch and dinner. I can arrange my own time, so after mealtimes is when I get my reading done. Sometimes when I am tired, I feel sleepy after meals, but I have learned not to yield to this impulse. I do not know how to explain this. I have observed that animals sleep after eating, and it appears to be a natural thing to do. But I know that if I go to sleep after a meal, nature makes clear to me that I have made a mistake, and I do not repeat it. I never eat at night and always go to bed on an empty stomach, so I'm always hungry when I open my eyes in the morning. I never know what it is not to be hungry at mealtimes, and my habits are so regular that I could set my watch by my stomach. Another common habit which is harmful is eating between meals. I have known people who are accustomed to nibble at food nearly all the time. Shelley records that he tried it as an experiment, thinking it might be a convenient way to get digestion done, but he found that it did not work. The stomach is apparently meant to work in pulses, to do a job of digesting and then to rest and accumulate the juices for another job. It will accustom itself to a certain regime and will work accordingly, but if, when it has half digested a load of food, you pile more food in on top, you make as much trouble as you would make in your kitchen if you required your cook to prepare another meal before she has cleaned up after the last one. Three times a day is enough for any adult to eat. Children require to eat oftener because their bodies are more active and they not merely have to keep up weight but to add to it. 
The simplest way to arrange matters with children is to give them three good meals at the hours when adults eat, and then to give them a couple of pieces of fruit between breakfast and lunch, and again between lunch and supper. I have never seen a child who would not be satisfied with this when once the habit was established. I have already spoken of the cooking and serving of food. I consider that the gastronomic art, as it is pompously called, is 90% plain rubbish. To be sure, if foods are appetizingly prepared and look good and smell good and taste good, they will cause the gastric juices to flow abundantly, as the Russian scientist Pavlov has demonstrated by practical experiment with the stomach pump. But I know without any stomach pump that the best thing to make my gastric juices flow is hard work and a spare diet. When I come home from five sets of tennis and have a cold shower and a rub down, my gastric juices will flow for a piece of cold beefsteak and a cold sweet potato quite as well as for anything that is served by a leisure class chef. Needless to say, I want food to be fresh and I want it to be clean and I have other things to do with my time and money than to pamper my appetites and encourage food whims. If you have a grandmother or ever had one, you know what grandmothers tell you about hot nourishing food, but I have tried the experiment and satisfied myself that there is absolutely no difference in nourishing qualities between hot food and cold food. If you chew your food sufficiently, it will all be 98 and 6 tenths degree food when it gets to your stomach. And that is the way your stomach wants it. Of course, if you have been out in a blizzard and are chilled and want to restore the body temperature, a hot drink will be one of the quickest ways. And if the emergency is extreme, you may even add a stimulant. On the other hand, if you are suffering from heat, it is sensible to cool your body by a cold drink but you should use as much judgment with yourself as you would with a horse, which you do not permit to drink a lot of cold water when he is heated up and is going into his stall to stand still. I have mentioned the word stimulants, and this opens a large subject. There are drugs which affect the body in two different ways. Some excite the nerves, and through the nerves, the heart and bloodstream to more intense activity. Others have the effect of deadening the nerves and dulling the sense of exhaustion and pain. One of these groups is called stimulants and the other is called narcotics. But as a matter of fact, the stimulants are really narcotics because they operate by dulling the nerves whose function is to prevent the over accumulation of fatigue poisons. In other words, they keep the nerves and muscles from knowing that they're tired and so they go on working. It is possible, of course, to conceive of an emergency in which that is necessary. Once upon a time, on a hunting trip, I had been traveling all day and was caught in a rainstorm and exhausted and chilled to the bone. I had to make camp without a fire. So when I got the tent up, I wrapped myself in blankets and drank a couple of tablespoons full of whiskey. That is the only time I have ever taken whiskey in my life and it warmed me almost instantly and did me no harm. In the same way, there were two or three occasions when I was on the verge of a nervous breakdown and could not sleep and let the doctor give me a sleeping powder. But in each case, I knew that I was fooling with a dangerous habit and I did no more fooling than necessary. No one should make use of either stimulants or narcotics except in extreme emergency and never but a few times in a lifetime. What you should do is to change your habits so that you will not need to overstrain. All these drugs are habit forming. That is to say, they leave the body no better and with a craving for a repetition of the relief. When you are tired, it is because your muscles and nerves are storing up fatigue poisons more readily than your bloodstream can get rid of them. You need to know about this condition, and exhaustion and pain are nature's protective warning. If you put a stop to the warning, you are as unintelligent as the eastern despo who used to cut off the head of the messenger who brought bad tidings. If when you have a headache, 
You go into a drugstore and let the druggist mix you one of those white fizzy drinks. What you are doing is not to get rid of the poison in your bloodstream, but merely to reduce the action of your heart so as to keep the blood from pressing so fast into the aching blood vessels and nerves. You may try that trick with your heart a number of times, but sooner or later, you will try it once too often. Your heart will stop a little bit quicker than you meant it to. Drugs are poisons, and their action depends upon their poisoning some particular portion of the body, temporarily paralyzing it. And bear this in mind, they are nonetheless poisonous because they are natural products. You can kill yourself by cyanide of potassium, which comes out of a chemist's retort, but you can kill yourself just as dead with laudanum, which comes out of a plant, or with the contents of the venom sac of a snake. You are poisoning yourself nonetheless, certainly if you use alcohol, which is made from the juices of beautiful fruits and has had hosts of famous poets writing songs about it. Or you can poison yourself with the caffeine, which you get in a lovely brown bean, which comes from Brazil, fragrant to the nostrils and delicious to the taste. You may drink wine and tea and coffee for a hundred years and have your picture published in the newspapers as a proof that these habits conduce to health. But nothing will be said about the large number of people who practiced these habits and didn't live so long, and about how long they might have lived if they hadn't practiced these habits. I was brought up in the South, and my elders belonged to a generation which had grown up in wartime. For this reason, many of the men both drank and smoked to excess, and in my boyhood, I lived among them and watched them, and with the help of advice from a wise mother, I conceived a horror of every kind of stimulant. The alcoholic poets could not fool me. I had been in the alcoholic wards of the hospitals. I had seen one man after another beautiful and kindly and gracious men dragged down into a pit of torment and shame. Alcohol is, I think, the greatest trap that nature ever set for the feet of the human race. It is responsible for more degradation and misery than any other evil in the world. And I say this knowing only well that my socialist friends will cry, what about capitalism? My answer is that I doubt if there ever would have been any capitalism in the world if it had not been for alcohol. If the workers had not been systemically poisoned and all their savings taken from them by the gin mill, they would never have submitted to the capitalist system. They would have built the cooperative commonwealth at the time they were building the first factories. I listened to the arguments of my radical friends about personal liberty. But I note that in Russia, when it was a question of making practical revolution and keeping it alive, the first thing the leaders did was to drag out the contents of the wine cellars of the palaces and smash them in the gutters. Tea and coffee are, of course, much milder in their effects than alcohol. You can play with them longer and the punishment will be less severe. But if you make habitual use of them, you will pay the penalty which all drugs exact from the system. Your brain and your nerve centers will be less sensitive, less capable of working except under the influence of drugs. Their reacting power will be dulled and they will wear out more quickly. I have watched the slaves of the morning cup of coffee and know how they suffer when they do not get it. Likewise, I have watched the tea drinkers it is comical to live in England and see all the able-bodied men obliged to leave their work at four o'clock in the afternoon and seek the regular stimulus for their tired nerves. If you are to meet anybody, it is always for tea that the ceremony is set, and if you refuse to drink tea, your hostess will be uncomfortable, unable to talk about anything but the strange, incredible notion that one can live without tea. I discovered after a while the solution of this problem. I would say that I prefer a little hot water, if you please. And so my hostess would pour me a cup of hot water and I would sit and gravely sip it and everybody would be perfectly content. I was conforming to the outward appearance of normality, which is what the British conventions require. I have never drunk a cup of coffee, so I do not know what its effect on me would be. 
but some fifteen years ago I drank a glass of very weak iced tea at eight o'clock in the evening and did not get to sleep until four or five the next morning. So I know that there is really a drug in tea. I know also that I might accustom my system to it, just as I might learn to poison my lungs with nicotine without being made immediately and suddenly ill. But why should I wish to do this? Life is so interesting to me that I do not need to stimulate my brain centers in order to appreciate the thrill of it. And when I'm tired, I can rest myself by listening to music or by reading a worthwhile novel, things which I have found do not leave the after effects of nicotine. I remember the first time I met Jack London. Our meeting consisted in good part of his kidding me because I was lacking in the congenial vices of the cafe. He told me how much I had missed because I had never been drunk. One ought to try the great adventure at least once. Poor Jack is gone because his kidneys gave out at 40 and nothing could seem more ungracious than to point out that I am still alive and finding life enjoyable. Yet, in this book, we're trying to find out how to live, and if there are habits which wreck and destroy a magnificent physique and bring a great genius to death at the age of 40, surely the rest of us want to know about it and to be warned in time. I mentioned Jack London in this connection because he has said the last word on the subject of alcohol. Read John Barleycorn, and especially read between the lines of it, and you will not need my argument to persuade you to be glad that the 18th Amendment has been written into the Constitution, and that it is your duty as a socialist not merely to obey it, but to vote for its enforcement. I am proceeding on the assumption that your life is of importance to you, that you have a job to do which you know to be worthwhile and to which you desire to apply your powers. You agree with me that the workers of the world are suffering and that it is necessary for them to find their freedom and that it takes hard work and hard thinking. You may say that I exaggerate the amount of harm that is done to the system by tea and coffee, alcohol, and tobacco. Well, let us assume that in moderate quantities they do no harm at all. Even so, I have the right to ask you to show that they do some good. Otherwise, surely, it is a mistake for the workers to spend their savings upon them. Consider, for example, the amount of money which the wage slaves of the world for two or three years to spend this amount upon good reading matter. Do you not think there would be an improvement in their condition? Surely, you cannot maintain that the use of tobacco is necessary to the activities of the brain. Surely, you do not think that a man has to have a cigarette in order to stimulate his thoughts or to smoke a pipe to rest himself after his work is done. I offer myself as evidence in such a controversy. I have written as many books as any man in the radical movement, and the sum total of my lifetime smoking amounts to one half of one cigarette. I tried that when I was eight years old, and somebody told me a policeman would arrest me if he caught me and I threw away the cigarette and ran and hid in an alley and have not yet caught over my scare. In the Journal for Industrial Hygiene for October 1920 is an article entitled Fatigue and Efficiency of Smokers in a Strenuous Mental Occupation. Experiments were conducted among telegraph operators, and the result showed that the heavy smokers of the group show a higher output rate at the beginning of the day than the light smokers, but their rate falls off more markedly in the late hours, and their production for the whole day is definitely less than that of the light smokers. The heavy smokers also show less ability than the light smokers to respond to increasing pressure of work in the late hours of the day by handling their full share of the work presented. One point upon which every medical authority agrees is that the use of nicotine is of deadly effect upon the immature organism. Half-grown youths who smoke cigarettes will never be full-sized men. They will never have normal lungs or a normal heart. And likewise, 
all authorities agree about the effect of smoking upon the organism of women. I have what little help I could to the task of helping to set women free and to make them the equals of men. But I was always pained when I discovered that some of my feminist friends understood by woman's emancipation no more than her right to adopt man's vices. I would say to these ardent young female radicals who cultivate the art of dangling a cigarette from their lower lip and sip cocktails out of the coffee cups in Greenwich Village cafes, that they will never be able to bear sound children. But I know that this would not interest them. They don't want to bear any children at all. So I say that they will never be able to think straight thoughts and will be nervous invalids when they are 30. We went to war to make the world safe for democracy and we put several millions of our young men into armies. And if there were any of them who did not already know how to smoke cigarettes, they learned it under official sanction. So now we have a national tobacco bill that runs up to two billions and will ensure us a new generation of Class C rating. Speaking to the young radicals who are reading my books, I say, we want to make the world over, to make it a place of freedom and kindness, instead of the hell of greed and hate that it is today. For that purpose, we need a new moral code, and we can never win our victory without it. I have attended radical conventions sitting in unventilated halls amid clouds of tobacco smoke and listening to men wrangle all through the day and a great part of the night. I have watched the fatal dissensions in the movement, the quarrelings of the right-wingers and the left-wingers and all stages and degrees in between. And I have wondered, not jestingly, but in pitying earnest, how much of all those personalities and factional misunderstanding had their origin in carbon dioxide and nicotine. There is no use suggesting such ideas to the older men whose habits are fixed, but a new generation is coming on with a new vision of the enormous task before it. And it is too much to expect of these young men and women that they shall realize in advance the grim task they have to do and shall learn to run the machine of their body so as to get out of it the maximum amount of service. Is it too much to hope for? that some day we shall have a race of young fighters for truth and justice who are willing to live abstemious lives and consecrate themselves to the task of delivering mankind from wage, slavery, and war? End of chapter 22. If I may ask for your help in befriending the YouTube algorithm, hit that like button. And if you want to stay with me and finish this series, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell. That way you'll notified when I put up my next video. So let's head on over to the next video for chapter 23.